I'm not trying to discourage people from getting married. I just want people to feel like they have a lot of happiness within their hands. That was Jenny Tates on Psychologists Off the Clock. We are three clinical psychologists here to bring you cutting edge and science-based ideas from psychology to help you flourish in your relationships, work, and health. I'm Dr. Debbie Sorensen, practicing in Mile High, Denver, Colorado, and co-author of Act Daily Journal. I'm Dr. Yael Schoenbrunn, a Boston-based clinical psychologist, assistant professor at Brown University, and author of the upcoming book, Work, Parent, Thrive. And from sunny San Diego, I'm Dr. Jill Stoddard, author of Be Mighty and the Big Book of Act Metaphors. We hope you take what you learn here to build a rich and meaningful life. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. Psychologists Off the Clock is proud to be partnered with Praxis Continuing Education. Praxis is the premier provider of evidence-based training for mental health professionals. And here at Psychologists Off the Clock, we are huge fans of Praxis. One of the things I love most about Praxis is they offer both live and on-demand courses. So if you're really looking for that live interaction with other people who are taking the course, you can get that. Or if you have a busy schedule and you need something that you can just kind of click onto whenever you have time, they offer that as well. And every course I have ever taken from Praxis has really been of such value to me. I get questions a lot from clinicians who are looking for ACT training or other types of trainings. And Praxis is my go-to place that I send people no matter what level they are because they have really good beginner trainings for people who have no experience. And they also have terrific advanced trainings on different topics and just people who want to keep building their skills. You can go to our website and get a coupon for the live trainings by going to our offers page at offtheclockpsych.com slash sponsors. And we'll hope to see you there. This is Yael. I'm here with Katie, our dissemination coordinator, to talk about this episode, How to Be Single and Happy, an interview that I did with Jenny Tates. And I think it's such an important topic. And Katie, I know that this topic is an important one for you as well. Yeah, Yael. I actually am really grateful because I think it's a topic that we don't talk enough about, not just on this podcast, but in general, it's sort of the like, I don't know, is it enough to say the dirty secret of what it's like to be in the dating scene is all of the feelings and not usually like comfortable feelings that come with it. And so hearing Jenny really launch into those and not shying away from what it's really like to be in the dating scene. I think I both felt, uh, heard and validated and also equally called out because I've been in the dating scene um, and, you know, had pretty much everything that, that Jenny talked about. And so it was, I think, refreshing and also a little bit uh, uh, heart aching to kind of hear some of the stuff that, that Jenny talked about with you in, in her interview. Yeah. And there's so, I I think that on the one hand, dating isn't talked about enough. And then on the other hand, it's talked about a lot in these really simplistic kind of hacky ways. And what I love about Jenny Tates's approach is that it's incredibly evidence-based. It's incredibly validating. She draws on all sorts of evidence-based approaches that help you to be more effective, but also help you to manage exactly what you're saying, all the difficult emotions that come up with dating. And there's a lot of difficult emotions that come up with dating. Yeah. It actually made me think a lot of Debbie's recent episode on emotion efficacy therapy and and sort of the workability of when emotions get really high or really uncomfortable, kind of the, the story that we start telling ourselves about what's happening and sort of the, the patterns that we fall into. And I I feel like she really hit on so many aspects of whether it's dating or, or being in a relationship that isn't working for you. Or trying to get to the point of being on a date, right? That they're even just the journey into getting a first date can be a really painful one. And I think 
Katie, what you're saying is so important that she draws from all these approaches that have these very on the ground practical tips and tools that you can use to manage the feelings, but also to be more effective. And you don't have to be familiar with the treatments themselves. They just are great because they offer you tools that can be used. And so what I want to say is that for folks who are dating or know somebody who's dating, I really recommend that you stay tuned all the way to the end because she offers tips on staying happy even when you want a relationship and don't have one, how to start conversations on dates, wise strategies to approach dating apps, and and so much more. Really like on the ground things that you can do as you're going through the process. Yeah. I loved her... Jenny's thoughts about rumination, regret, and an emotion avoidance. And I kind of was thinking, man, Jenny, you got to have three R's. It's got to be like rumination, (laughs) regret, and resisting emotions. (laughs) Maybe I'll send her a message. (laughs) You said she'd probably be receptive to it. (laughs) (laughs) I guess this was an episode where I really just tied back to so many of our previous episodes. I even drew into when we had our farewell with Diana and she was talking about Daniel Pink's book on regret and how regret can be really informative to us if we let it. Jenny talked a lot about how that regret can be almost like a closer. It can kind of freeze us or send us into behavior patterns that are really unworkable. Um, And so whether it's, you know, this fear of regret or this anticipated or, you know, getting into that rumination about what ifs or what, what happened, you know, if we can kind of allow and be aware of those experiences, it, it kind of frees us up to make more valued choices a little bit, which I, think is what Jenny was also talking about. It's like move towards the things that you care about within the context of dating. Yeah. Yeah. And so the conversation is about dating, but I think Katie, what you're pointing to is that they're just wise strategies for living well, right? When you don't have the situation, the circumstances or the things that you really long for, that we can still live a full, happy, meaningful life. And I think that is, you know, really what we're all about on this podcast is is sort of finding the meaning, living rich lives, even when things are imperfect and finding really practical evidence-based strategies to do that. And that is exactly what Jenny offers in this episode. So we hope you enjoy it. I'm here with Jenny Tates, who is a practicing clinical psychologist and assistant clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry at UCLA and an author. Jenny's writing on various topics in evidence-based psychology appears regularly in the New York Times, and I got to prep by reading amazing pieces on keeping suffering from turning into emotional pain through radical acceptance, simple brief exercises to reduce anxiety and stress, finding hope when you're feeling pretty darn hopeless, how to worry more mindfully. And I loved each of these pieces and was just really impressed by how Jenny was able to pack so much science and simple practices into a brief, engaging read. So I highly recommend that people go check those out. And she's also author of two books. The first is End Emotional Eating. And then her more recent book, which we'll be discussing today, is How to Be Single and Happy, Science-Based Strategies for Keeping Your Sanity While Looking for a Soulmate. Welcome, Jenny. Thank you so much. It's nice to talk to you, Yael. I'm so glad to have you here. I want to start out by thanking you for making the time and also by thanking the listener who reached out to suggest you and the topic of finding happiness while single. We actually talk a lot about marriage and parenting on this podcast, and I thought it was really a wonderful suggestion to talk about being happy while single. So I wonder if we can just begin with an orienting question of who is this book and and, and our conversation for? Yeah, so the conversation is for anyone who is either unhappy, either in a current relationship or in wondering, like, should I be leaving? Would I be better off being single than in an unhappy partnership? Or for people that are really looking for a partner and struggling with dating, especially today on dating apps, it can be really frustrating to feel hopeful around meeting someone, especially when there's so many people out there similarly struggling. And so it's either for, you know, if you're unhappy and wanting to strike up some courage, or you're trying your very best and suffering at the same time. 
And I want to note that as I was reading the book, um, it occurred to me that it's not just for young people. I actually, as I was reading it, I have somebody close to me who's elderly and a widow. And so many of the themes and practices that you recommend and, and walk people through, it really struck me that they would be a very good fit for somebody at, at either end of the age spectrum and in the middle. I so appreciate you adding that. This is also for people that have had recently have recently ended relationships either due to loss or a breakup. And so absolutely this applies across the lifespan. And some people um, wonder, I, I most of the book is focused on women. And I just wrote from a, you know my perspective as a female and having worked with a lot of women, but I really enjoy some male readers have reached out to me and found that the book similarly applies to them. And this is also equally applicable regardless of same sex or heterosexual couples. You do have a lot of yourself in the book. I mean, the, the book is so steeped in science, but you do share some of your personal story that you, although you're currently married, I understand that you went through your share of painful single experiences. So I wonder if you could start us off by sharing a little bit about your history of being unhappily single and how that journey led you to writing this book. Yeah. So my parents got divorced when I was seven and I sort of had this mindset that it, it it was hard to have a successful, rewarding marriage. And I worried about that because sometimes the things that matter most to you also inspire the most anxiety. And I certainly worried from a young age that this was something that mattered to me. And I always sort of had the idea that I wanted to be a mom and that that was a core value and something that I really hoped to pursue in the future. And I a lot of my closest friends got married right after college and I was still single late into my twenties, early thirties. And I was, you know, I was constantly wondering when I was going on dates, if I was being too picky or if I should settle and what was the sweet spot between having standards and being flexible. And, um, and I talk about this in the book, but I, I did end up meeting someone that I got engaged to and, through a lot of my work as a therapist in training, I really realized that we just had different kind of life trajectories and I was willing to feel uncomfortable in the service of living a life that seemed more authentic to me. And I talk about in the book, you know, this person's a wonderful person and no ill will towards him and hope he's doing well. But I, I do talk a lot about the shame and uh, questioning uh, that so many people face. And I felt so incredibly lucky that I was dating concurrent with becoming a therapist, specializing in mindfulness. But, you know, so many people out there don't necessarily want to be a therapist specializing in mindfulness. So I wanted to offer the many people out there the chance to uh, find freedom the way I did through really practicing, like being lonely right now does not mean you're going to be lonely forever. Being uncomfortable doesn't mean that's going to be your destiny. And so I talk a lot about my own experience of being courageous and getting really clear about what I wanted my life to stand for and making space for all the discomfort that came with that from having to tell people at work to losing large sums of money that I didn't have as a graduate student. Um, but the, the peace that came with that. And also, I mean, concurrent with my own struggles, I was really struck in my clinical practice by patients that I thought were so like beyond fabulous. Like these are people that are smart, nice, charismatic. And they were some of my like most lovely, wonderful clients were citing to me lines from dating books and telling me about going on retreats with some of the authors of some of those books that cost a near fortune. And I just thought like, geez, like seriously, like, you know, this is, you're smart and like, we're feminists. Like, what are we talking about here? And so I, I, I wrote the book that I wished that was available for me to read at the time. I grew up and I remember my mom gave me the rules. I don't know if you've read that. I'm sure you have, but it was so antithetical to how I wanted to show up and it was very confusing. And this is definitely the book that I wish she had handed me instead. Um, but I want to get back to the central premise of this book, which is this question of whether you can be single and, and be single not by choice and still be happy. Broadly speaking, what is the answer to that question? The answer to that question is you absolutely can. So much of our happiness has to do with our mindset. 
and the activities that we pursue and our ability to be mindful, really present. So if you are incredibly present and pursuing activities that matter to you, marriage might be nice and might change your circumstances somewhat. But in huge research studies, one of them in particular with a population of 24,000 people, which is a huge sample, found on average marriage increased happiness by 1%. And I'm not trying to discourage people from getting married. I just want people to feel like they have a lot of happiness within their hands. And people out there might even think for a moment, have, have they been happy when they were single and what was going on in those moments? Um, I fully respect and appreciate that some people do really want to connect with someone and that's wonderful. And I applaud you for making space for the, that wish, but I also want you to enjoy your life while you're looking for that person. I love that study that shows that being married incrementally might shift your happiness set point, but that it it's it's small and it really does get to this set of findings that you talk about in your book. And we actually had um, the author of, of that research, Sonia Lubomirsky, on our show to talk about these different predictors of happiness and that we often think that life circumstances, including being married, are a huge predictor of our happiness, but actually they're much smaller than we think. And and part of what you you talk so much about in your book is this piece of the pie that predicts happiness, our intentional activities, our mindset, our actions, our uh, ability to clarify values and then follow through with them. That actually has a huge impact. And so a lot of the recommendations that you make are to sort of um, reduce the focus that we place on whether or not we're partnered and to really focus on those intentional activities. And you give so many of these concrete uh, examples and practices that people can try out. Yeah. And for people that might be listening and struggling with other circumstances in their life, the same, the same rules apply. If you're really unhappy in your workplace or where you're living, I don't want to stretch too much beyond the focus, but I think to really keep in mind that there are, even when you feel stuck by circumstances, there are ways that you can powerfully shift your moments by being really present and adding in things that you might enjoy on purpose, even if you feel exhausted and depleted. Yeah. So you set your book up to first address some of the central challenges that can make us so deeply unhappy while we're single. They include rumination, regret, and emotional avoidance. And I wanted to start by talking a little bit about rumination because it's such a common habit for people who are focused on trying to get something that seems elusive. And as you're saying, like we're talking about it in the context of dating, but this could apply to anything, something that's you know just out of your grasp, like a promotion or wanting to buy a house or um, wanting to get pregnant. In this case, we're talking about dating. But when something is just out of our grasp, our mind tends to get stuck in a loop how can people understand this trap of rumination? And then what are some ways that we can work that, what are some practices that we can use to exit that trap of rumination? So rumination is overthinking in a way that is not necessarily strategic or trying to work on problem solving, but just kind of circular. And rumination is one of the biggest predictors of depression. And actually increasingly researchers are pretty clear that rumination predicts a host of suffering. It's kind of similar to worry. It's, you know, instead of just going on a bad date and thinking that was a bummer, it's adding to that all the other bad dates, all the future bad dates, comparisons to other people that had it easy on the first date. It's just really taking current pain and spiraling mentally. And one reason that people do it is because they confuse ruminating with problem solving and they think at some point they will hit some sort of jackpot solution or have an epiphany. Um, But if you actually think about it, one activity that I describe in the book and I really encourage people to pursue is to take a minute to just right here, right now, what are the pros of overthinking? What are the costs of overthinking? What are the pros of accepting uncertainty? What are the costs of accepting uncertainty? Because having a clear, like in your own handwriting, tactical reminder, like on an index card or take a screenshot and have it on your phone, because it's such a habit that people really need to be super aware of what are the downsides, not only short-term, but long-term. And um, another way to break free of this habit, in addition to being super aware of the costs and benefits, is to have a couple of concrete activities you can do instead. 
So if you're into Wordle or if you like the New York Times crossword puzzle or an adult coloring book, I've seen like just in a gift shop and they had like adult coloring books of, you know, Bridgerton. And um, I think paint by number is kind of interesting because you really have to focus on, you know, one is blue and two is teal. And um, it really brings your full attention because it's hard to kind of get out of your head with thinking, um, but doing some sort of activity that you're inclined to do even at 11 p.m. in your apartment when you're exhausted is really useful. And rumination, I, I can't even begin to tell you so many studies have found that rumination more than the event itself is what causes the damage. And of course, I don't want to minimize in any way that you've been through a lot, but as a self-compassionate gesture, breaking free of this habit is one way to start to move forward. Right. It's the primary event is that you had a bad date and, and the primary emotion following that might be disappointment or frustration. And rumination really comes after that where you sort of really get hooked on it. And as you're saying, you just kind of go into all sorts of mental spirals about it. And that's the secondary set of internal experiences that we have some opportunities to do differently, right? the date went badly, we're going to feel disappointed. We don't have much control over that. But the practices that you're describing are really helpful for the secondary part of that sequence of events where we can mindfully notice that we're getting caught in that mental loop and make a deliberate choice to do something different, something um, either more pleasant or distracting. And, And I love that question of just pausing and asking yourself, like, is this thinking, is this thought process that I find myself in, is it helping me? Because if it's helping you, you can use that and get somewhere different. But if you can honestly answer yourself that it's not helpful, then using some of those strategies that you described is probably a better pathway to go down. Entirely. And maybe it's also a matter of amount, maybe 10 minutes of thinking after the date of what are the big takeaways? What are the next steps going forward? But after a certain amount of time, it's probably not very productive to keep replaying and looping. Yeah. You also define regret as part rumination and part self-blame. Um, so that when we get stuck in regret, it's sort of we're stuck in that overthinking and we're also feeling like we've done something wrong. We've made a mistake. And that's the feeling of regret. So how can people searching for their soulmates sit with that regret, sit with the loss of not having the life that they thought they would? I I think, again, coming up with some sort of concrete takeaway, but also not, I think that the torture is when you really blame yourself. And if people can add a dose of self-compassion, I made the best decision I could at the time. There are so many ways to perceive a situation. So much of regret is based on our assumptions, thinking if only I had made this decision, things would have been so much better. If only I had moved to this city, then I would have found someone. But that's that's all very speculative and not necessarily helpful. But what are the things you can do right this moment? And how can you offer yourself a dose of kindness? Because it is hard to make decisions with limited information and have you know, the same perspective that you had 10 years later in the moment, you know, 10 years ago. Um, And so I think to really like, think like, is beating myself up moving me towards the life I want? Or is it imprisoning me really? I don't know if you've read this book, but there's a book called The Midnight Library that folks who practice acceptance and commitment therapy were singing its praises. And so I picked it up and it's this really fascinating uh, story. It's fiction about a woman that engages in some of that regretful thinking in her life. And then it sort of follows her down this path of all these different life paths that she could have gone. And you see that there's really no way to create a perfect life. And you're always going to be stuck if you allow yourself to go down this path with that thought of, could I have done this better? Could I have made a choice that would have landed me in a better spot? It's this question that we can't ever fully answer because it's a fantasy that we would ever know what things had been like if we had gone down a different path. And that's what regret can cause us to ask this unanswerable question. And what you're saying is to bring yourself back into the present moment, to learn from what's happened and to sort of really think through, you know, where you're at and where you'd like to go in this present moment going forward. Exactly. And one of the biggest, one of my biggest hopes in writing this book is to help people have a sense of faith in themselves and trust their inner wisdom. And I think too much of regret-fueled thinking 
leads to really struggling with not feeling like you can trust your gut or um, make decisions for yourself, or you're so focused on the past that you can't make decisions in the here and now that move you forward. And so and it, it's incredible through writing. I've spoken to some really fascinating people. One person um, I spoke to before the pandemic had committed a, a horrible crime that he was incarcerated for for many years. And he was sentenced to prison and served his time and and he learned his lesson and now he's doing so much incredible work helping other people that are formerly incarcerated find meaningful work his name is chris wilson um he wrote a book called the master plan and i think that's he's such an inspiring person around the topic of regret because you can make a terrible mistake but to throw your whole life away would be such a a missed opportunity to contribute and and have a second chance. And at every moment, we are kind of at a fork in the road. We could either live bigger or smaller or have trust in ourselves or doubt ourselves. And I think, obviously, I, I'm not uh, encouraging people to make big mistakes or to be overly permissive with mistakes that they've made, but to really take a second and learn from them. I'm guessing that even someone in the recovery community, if they spend too much time beating themselves up, they're not going to be a setup for success as someone that offers a little self-compassion that gives you the energy to move forward. But too much of the negative thinking and self-blame is paralyzing and depleting. Yeah. I love that you're bringing up self-compassion in this context because it does really kind of open you up to be able to learn those lessons and carry them forward in a more productive way as opposed to the self-criticism. And that self-criticism, that the, the self-critical voice is wired into us for protective reasons, but it can really stop us in our tracks and prevent us from learning and growing. So let's carry it through to like an example um, in the modern dating world. So say you have a young person in your office who has been trying to date and and having a hard time really connecting with people. And, you know, there's a lot of pressure on hooking up and sleeping with somebody early on to sort of land the deal, so to speak. How do you help somebody who's feeling a lot of shame about sleeping with a lot of uh, people that they don't know very well and yet not having the relationship progress further? How do you help them not drop into unhelpful regret and self-blame, but rather use it as an opportunity to grow? What kind of advice or practices would you recommend? I think, you know, this is so relevant. I think really having that, the self-compassion of it's really hard to want something and have socially prescribed, you know, suggestions around how to best pursue that and pressure from other people and to really think through, like really kind of having this mantra of I did the best with what I, you know, how I could in that situation. But along that, like really having this like awareness that you did the best you could with the information you had at the time. What what do I know now that I want to take going forward? Like, do I want to have a line that I tell people to try to slow things down? Do I want to have a drink limit? Um, so I'm not in a position where I can't make decisions that, you know, I won't kick myself for tomorrow. So I think there's something about like a next step that's useful, but also some, I mean, a little bit of regret can be helpful in terms of making better decisions later, but I think too much is, is what leads people to not even want to make decisions or to feel terrible about themselves. Yeah. So using that regret is like a sign that there's something to learn, but noticing when it keeps you from keeping on trying. And actually that gets to this concept of hope that you wrote about in the New York Times and that you write about in your book that I just, I love. So how do you stay hopeful when you've been on the dating scene for a long time without success? Yeah. I mean, hope is not just a feeling, it's a behavior. And so having a clear sense of what you want and willingness to stick to it, even when it's not easy or when you don't feel like it's going to amount to anything is really key. And so acting hopeful, surprisingly, like leaning into the behaviors you would do if you were full of optimism and felt like the world was, you know, your oyster is super, super important. And, you know, yeah, it's, it's so important, especially with 
dating, which is quite a process to not beat yourself up or beat the process up, but to keep kind of putting one foot in front of the other with an attitude of curiosity and flexibility and this stance of, yeah, I'm going to celebrate myself for just persisting in the trying, obviously with tweaking in a way that allows you to persist better or without burning yourself out too much, but that's key. I I love that tip to sort of identify what, if the value is to remain hopeful, what might my actions day to day look like if I was full of hope and optimism and then picking some of those behaviors and acting as if, even if you don't feel particularly hopeful in, in a given moment. I think a key value that a lot of people probably identify with having it some, you know, is perseverance and perseverance. It means that you're facing obstacles. I mean, you you can't act on that value unless it's hard. And do you want to be the kind of person that perseveres with compassion and with cheerleading? Or do you want to be the person that's, you know, your biggest bully and pessimist and curled up in a ball? Yeah. So, so that kind of is a nice segue to my next question, which is, you know, the reality is dating is hard and sometimes it's, the emotions are so painful. You feel rejected. You feel just downright crummy and, and the emotions can be incredibly intense. And part of what I love about your book is that you draw on practices from dialectical behavior therapy, which is a treatment that was developed for emotion dysregulation. So for people who really have a hard time managing very painful emotions Um, And so I I was hoping that you could talk a little bit about what are common examples of the way that emotions can painfully and problematically arise during the dating phases of our lives and what kind of strategies you recommend for managing those big painful emotions when they do come up. So a lot of the, the most common emotions that I hear people talking about that are struggling with dating include loneliness um, shame and sadness, probably loneliness, sadness, and then shame, um, if I was going to go in order of magnitude. And so I think with to approach emotions, we need to do two things. We need to both like try to do some problems. And there's a few, many things we should do with emotions, but do, to do some problem solving, to think through, I feel lonely on Sunday afternoons if I have not seen a person the entire day how can I strategize so next Sunday I have social contact like sometime during the day? So I think some amount of problem solving is key. Some amount of making space for yourself to feel the way you feel, normalizing it, not judging it, not trying to make it go away, but sending with it a small amount. And someone is acting differently than how you feel because surprisingly, you know, loneliness makes us want to hold up rather than call someone or join Bumble BFF or or do something that's going to allow us to have more opportunities. And so for shame to really also question, like, have I done something wrong? Like shame is valid if you have deviated from, you know, your values and you've been caught by other people doing so. It's like, I'm embarrassed that people saw me cheating or lying or stealing or something. But if you're trying your very best to try to meet someone and you're still uncoupled, there is literally no reason to feel like you can't go to the dinner party and be the only person there without a plus one because of that fact. So how would you act if you weren't ashamed? Would you hold your head up high? Would you take up space? Would you not you know, cross your fingers and toes and no one asks you about dating? Would you say something direct about, you know, I'm so happy to be here, but I don't want to participate in a personal interview at this point. There are ways that we need to approach our emotions and act differently than how we feel and really think about whether the feelings that we're feeling are based on facts or catastrophic thoughts. Yeah. One other emotion, this might not be the most dominant one, but I feel like it comes up a lot for people who are doing the apps and get, for example, ghosted a lot, right? They get angry. So you might be on date two or three, and then the person who you were seeing just kind of no-shows on you. And the common emotional response is anger, right? You've been hurt, you've been rejected. And so there's that initial emotion, and that very quickly can lead to anger. And the way behaviorally that anger can show up is in, you know, very aggressive moves like stalking or calling and yelling or spreading really nasty comments online about this person. 
And and so I'm I'm curious what are some recommendations for for big angry feelings because I think that is fairly common in in the dating life too and and for very good reason. Oh, this is so fabulous. So I mean I think anger tells us like people think I don't want to feel angry that's not a great way to feel but anger tells us that our needs haven't been met and we haven't been respected. And so like I think you should celebrate like it's great that I feel angry. I have standards for how I want to be treated and I have self-respect and you know, my needs were not met and I have every right to feel really freaking angry. But then we need to really think through like, is stalking this person going to alleviate the anger or amplify it? So often acting on how we feel can kick it up a notch. So if we want to change how we feel, we really need to maybe again, like coming back to being a source of comfort to ourselves and trying to be mindful and trying to sort of focus on our values. Like what, what, am, what is the life that I want to move towards right now? If I want to move towards being with someone that has better communication patterns rather than it's going to ghost, maybe I need to directly address this person and say, what you did was really unacceptable. And I hope you could do better with the next person. And then, you know, you, you're having a voice and you're increasing self-respect, but you're also not prolonging your pain by putting your life on hold to punish the other person. I love what you just said. And it's so important to note that when we're feeling a particular way, the behavioral impulse is often something that will amplify that particular feeling. So when we feel angry, we want to act angry. And when we act angry, we we often get a immediate release, but it what research shows is that ultimately it causes us to feel more angry more often. So this idea that there's a catharsis when we release our anger is actually disproven by the research. When we release our anger in in more aggressive ways, it it may have sort of a really temporary effect, but it actually creates more anger over time. And so this opposite action idea that you're recommending in your book, and that comes from dialectical behavior therapy, is just such a nice, tangible way, practical, on-the-ground way to notice the emotion and be deliberate about about how we behaviorally respond in a way that can walk us more towards the the person that we want to be in the life that we want to lead. Yeah. And there's some, there's some way to kind of do both. Like if your anger feels like a 10, it might be opposite action to like at a four, send a quick text message. Like, Hey, after four dates, I would have expected some communication. I'm sorry that you weren't able to do that. That really hurt me. And I hope you could learn from my feedback, but maybe that's at a four. So that's even opposite action in terms of intensity. And that way you accomplish all your needs. You feel like you have a voice and you have a say and you also don't feel like you're about to explode. And this is so much easier said than done. I, I want to validate, like, you have every right to be absolutely livid if someone's disrespecting you as a person, especially if you've given them time. It makes me angry to just hear about my clients' experiences of being ghosted. And, you know, strangely, I do have a lot of clients that also talk to me about their struggles with communicating when they're not sure how they feel about someone. And, some of these people are just so anxious to say anything uncomfortable or have the thought that, you know, it's better not to say anything than to say something that someone doesn't want to hear, which really encourage people to rethink because that, that's just not true. Everyone wants closure rather than confusion. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I want people to know that anger makes perfect sense, but you deserve more than, than having your blood pressure spike and a tension headache. That advice to sort of use opposite action to bring your anger down where you can act on the anger, but in a more value aligned way is is such great advice. And I wanted to sort of follow up with a question about communication, because you offer a lot of guidance on how to communicate more clearly in ways that are assertive and that do allow you to own your right to be treated with respect and and, and to pursue the things that are important to you. And let me actually ask a specific question. How how would you recommend that people pleasers handle dates when they are a total dumpster fire, but you don't want to be rude? So it's this sort of communication dilemma of wanting to communicate that you're done and this isn't working, but also want to stay aligned with your value of being kind. This is so great. So I think the first step would be to set up a date where you're not going to be stuck at like a restaurant for three hours, but it can you set something up where the normal, you know, 
span of time you'd invest with that person would be an hour, like a coffee or a walk or, you know, a, one drink, you know, to set up the expectation from the get go. So there's not a mismatch of expectations in terms of time commitment. And I think the second part is actually like, I'm really a big fan of having a couple of lines saved. So in a high stress situation, you don't have to start from scratch and, you know, in the middle of a day that's going terribly, try to think about a way to communicate kindly if you're just like at a loss for words. So is there some way in your own voice you could, you know, include some sort of pleasantry, honest feedback, well wishes, you know, it was really, it's been like so nice talking to you and getting to know you. I unfortunately have a really early morning tomorrow and should get going, but I, I hope you like, you know, have a great night and um, really appreciate the chance to have learned more about you. Um, is there some way authentic to you? You know, I'm just, it sounds artificial because I'm not in the situation, uh, and, but to true to your situation, you know, well, with, you know, something positive from the day, direct feedback, well wishes that you could offer because while being kind to other people, you need to be kind to yourself. And you can also reframe. I think it's really helpful for people to reframe that maybe that that wasn't a great use of their time, but maybe that was their like good deed of the week. If this person's lonely and the, lacking the same level of social graces that you have, if you could have been a person that gave them a little source of connection or reduction of loneliness maybe that's one way to frame this as not a total dumpster fire waste of your time, but also you don't deserve to torture yourself. And so when a socially acceptable amount of time has lapsed, you know, to kind of jump in with a pleasant and, and authentic response. Yeah. So having a couple of ideas of ways that you can gracefully exit can help you just feel more prepared to to cut things short if you need to. The other thought I had as you were talking is the suggestion that you made really reminded me of this yes, no, yes script that uh, I was talking about with another guest on the Redefining Rich episode that we have, and we'll link to that in our show notes. But you know, when you get asked to do something that you don't really want to do, this is a really difficult position for people pleasers to be in, and it's even harder on a date because the expectations are are you know for your from yourself and from the other person can feel so intense. Um, and the yes no yes script is like something positive, and then and then you know basically drawing the line of no I can't do it, and then something positive. So it might be something, and this is very similar to what you just said, but it might be something like you know I had a, it was really nice to meet you. You're, you seem like such an interesting person. I don't think that this is a great fit, um, and I don't want to waste your time or my time. But I hope we have a chance to meet as you know friends in the future. So you can maybe communicate that this isn't a good fit, and that you'd like to end the night, but do it in a way that is aligned with being kind, which is usually a, a top value for, for people who are people pleasers. I love that. And I, I also just want people to also, especially if they're people pleasers, not offer more than they're willing to do. So I have a lot of clients that struggle with feeling like they need to offer up friendship as a secondary. That's a good point. Um, but to be, but to be authentic with that. And I think, look, part of dating and is, is that there's some level, I think this is the rules of the game that you're both going to show up and you both might not be on the same page in terms of interest. And that's unfortunate, but I, I don't want anyone to burn out in terms of feeling like they can't go on dates because they feel then they're hijacked and, and, um, they have no say in how their rest of their night's going to look. If someone is having a great time and wants to hold them at a restaurant, you don't need to agree to that. And maybe that gets to the acceptance piece of accepting that there might be uncomfortable emotions of saying no thank you to somebody who might be more interested than you are and knowing that it's okay to feel that way. And in fact, making space for that feeling while continuing forward in a value aligned way is exactly what healthy dating looks like, healthy productive dating looks like. Yeah. And you know, I worry that I didn't express thoughtfully enough the the kind of pleasant, assertive, pleasant sandwich. I, I think the way I said it sounds very like formulaic, but it should be really authentic and sincere. Like the person you're with doesn't just deserve like, I mean, it, it's kind of a canned line, but it's tailored to the person. So it's really actually 
validating. Like I really enjoyed hearing about your last trip. It sounds really interesting. I didn't know anything about hiking before we met. I actually am feeling more tired than I expected at this time. Um, but it was so great to meet you and I hope you have a great night. Yeah. If you're looking for a great way to support us here at Psychologists Off the Clock and make your life easier and healthier, you should go to my new favorite online store, Thrive Market. Thrive Market carries all your grocery and household essentials with the convenience of getting everything online and then quickly shipped right to your door. And right now you can get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift if you go to thrivemarket.com slash POTC. I love that I can use specific filters to curate my shopping experience so I can find organic meats and low sugar snacks for my kids. Plus, when you join, they give to a family in need. How cool is that? So join in on the savings with Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. Go to thrivemarket.com slash POTC for 30% off plus a free $60 gift. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash P-O-T-C, thrivemarket.com slash P-O-T-C. I know I talk about my kids a lot, but I also have two adorable dogs, Tilly and Hazel. We love to spoil them, which is why we love Whole Life Pet. Whole Life Pet makes single ingredient treats, meal mixers, supplements, and hydrating snacks for both dogs and cats. And if you try out Whole Life Pet, you're surprising your pets with fun new flavors while also supporting psychologists off the clock. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off your first order with free shipping over $50. When I open the Tuscan Blend Bistro Bowl Meal Mixer to add to Tilly and Hazel's food, they start wildly sniffing and can't wait to dig in. The best part is Whole Life Pet uses a freeze-dried process that locks in nutrients and freshness, and they never add chemicals, additives, preservatives, or anything artificial. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off your first order with free shipping over $50. If you're unsure about what to try, you can fill out their short questionnaire by clicking the red Start Today button on the home page. It will ask you a few questions and make custom product recommendations for your pets. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off today. All right, so moving on to a slightly different topic, I wanted to get your thoughts. And you you have a chapter where you talk a bit about folks who are in the time span where they're thinking about having children, but they're dating. And so the double whammy of the pressure of that and this feeling of like there's a biological clock ticking. Now, one thing I see a lot of in my clinical practice, I see a lot of couples is um, couples who part ways because one person wants to have a child and the other doesn't. And often because they've been together and trying to sort this out, they're older. And so they're now, if they've parted because they have different visions for the direction that they want life to go, the partner who wants to have a child is now on the dating scene and is also experiencing this tremendous pressure to like get it done quickly because there is a biological clock that can expire if they're not sort of moving forward at a rapid enough pace. And so, you know, the the broad question of like how to approach searching for a partner when we want to have a child and we're not, you know, in our 20s anymore is is a really complicated one. And I wonder if you can walk us through some of the things to think about and ways to approach dating during this span of life and under these circumstances. I think the first thing is I I can only imagine how difficult it is to choose between a person that you love and future possibility that you're not entirely sure will happen. Right. So, so a lot of these people are also experiencing a lot of grief as there's, you know, grieving the loss of that relationship, trying to date and also feeling the pressure. Exactly right. And so it's, it's so understandable to question that decision and struggle with regret in the short term potentially. But I think really having the, the thinking that in my mind, the best predictor of marital satisfaction or a longstanding happy relationship is shared values. And that is a key fundamental values difference. One person wants a family, one person doesn't. And so I think to really like celebrate your courage in speaking up for what you want and being willing to feel incredibly uncomfortable, I think to give yourself like so much kindness and compassion in the aftermath of making that decision is is key. And then the second part is, and I, I know this is really expensive and 
not an option everyone can pursue, but a lot of my patients find so much relief. And I talk a lot about this in the book. I interviewed a really wonderful fertility expert, Dr. Richard Mars, in in a chapter all about fertility. But there is something really kind of relieving about advances in medicine, allowing women to freeze eggs and feel like they don't have to like rush and settle or try to necessarily get pregnant right away if they, their ideal chance, you know, their ideal hope or vision would be having a, a partner to raise a child with. And so I really encourage people if they can to do some sort of problem solving to not feel like they're in a rush to, or that they have to force things or make decisions with, a, you know, a time line ticking, but to feel like they're doing something productive that can also give them a little bit of a a break in terms of rushing. Yeah. It it's it is it's another one of these tips that and I think this is true in all of psychology. It's easier said than done. I think the advice that we often give in in these in the kind of treatments that you and I practice is like hold the outcome lightly and bring yourself back to the present, be in the process. But when the outcome is something that feels so important and you feel some time pressure around it, it's so hard to hold it lightly. It's so hard to sort of bring yourself back to the present and not keep coming back to, but I have to get to that outcome. I, I'm running out of time. And so I wonder if there's any sort of practical strategies that you can offer for helping people get more back in the present moment when they find themselves repeatedly, you know, in dropping into that really pressured sense of, I got to get to that end outcome. My time is running out. I really love anchoring, like taking a second to feel your feet on the floor, checking in with yourself. What am I thinking, feeling, doing? Is what I'm doing helpful? You know, is it in line with what's happening in the present? If you still have a number of years or, you know, you're trying to save for egg freezing, that's something that you're going to do. I think really coming back to the present moment and living your best in this moment. And I do want to say a lot of people, unfortunately, that I see are a little beyond the age where egg freezing is recommended. And egg freezing is usually um, not recommended once you're in your mid 40s or early 40s even. And so for people that are past the point where they can realistically imagine having a biological child, I also really encourage people to think through like what are other ways to feel like I'm honoring my desire to serve in a parent role? Is it being a really hands-on aunt? Is it being a really hands-on big sister through volunteering? Is it being, is it considering other uh, roads? Like I talk about foster parenting in my book as well. And that seems like a really meaningful contribution and way to parent without necessarily having biological children. You talked in your book about something Kim Cattrall, the actress from Sex and the City, said, and I just loved it, where she she noted that there's so many ways to engage in a maternal role that have nothing to do with having your own biological child. Exactly, exactly. There's so many paths to parenthood. And it kind of relates to this other thought that I think can be really sticky for people who want to have a child but don't yet have a partner, which is... I want to have a child and I could have a child, like biologically speaking, I could freeze my eggs. I could go to a sperm bank. I could, if you have the funds, get a surrogate, I could adopt, but I don't want to do it without a partner. And I'm curious how you advise people to kind of think through the pros and cons of doing parenthood alone versus waiting it out in the hopes of doing it in this desirable kind of a set of circumstances. I love recommending people pursue getting more information from the people that are doing it. So there is a fantastic organization, Single Mothers by Choice, and it's nationwide and they have all sorts of resources where you can talk to other people that are doing it. You can get firsthand information from people that have gone down that and you can kind of check the facts of what it's like. And that organization also provides a really nice social support structure where they have picnics and activities. So you're not sort of doing this in isolation. I also just want to come back to something we touched on earlier with just how people mispredict how happy marriage will make them. I think people also mispredict how happy having children might make them. And so again, I just keep wanting to come back again while offering so much compassion for it's normal to want the things that you want. And even evolutionary, it's normal to want a partner and child. And that's entirely understandable. And I congratulate you for 
giving space to the things that matter to you. And also like, I do want people to fully believe you can be happy without a partner or without a biological child. If that's not within reach, if, if that's not happening in this moment, you can still feel a tremendous sense of joy. One other thing that I think people are really, I think research shows this pretty clearly that we're, we're not very good at predicting how we'll feel on the loneliness front that many people think sort of predict once I have a partner, I won't feel lonely anymore. But in fact, you can feel lonely in a room of people with your partner and you can feel not lonely on your own. And you talk a bit about loneliness in your book. And I think it's such an important thing to talk about in the context of, of dating because it is such a motivator that, that, you know, we want to partner so that we don't feel lonely. And yet loneliness is a little bit separate. So I wonder if you could talk about the problem of loneliness and how to understand, how to sort of wrap our heads around why we would feel lonely even when we're together and and what people who are single can do to manage the feeling of loneliness. So when therapists offer people solutions for loneliness, there's a couple, there's, a, I think a big one is trying to help people problem solve and how can you expand your support group and how can you get out more and how can you try new activities or hobbies? So I think a very understandable fix for loneliness is making more people show up in your life or expanding, you know, your chance to find more people, but actually a more powerful solution to loneliness is targeting what experts call maladaptive social cognitions, the thoughts that really make us feel painfully alone. And so thinking, oh, we have nothing in common, or there's nothing like me, or I don't like them anyhow. Um, and so we can have these thoughts, you know, when we're in a group of people, or even with a partner, like thinking like this person should be my everything is, is not a helpful social cognition. Like you need more than one person to feel supported and to get your, you know, have some sense of community. And so I love a particular acronym that was first described by David Burns called TikTok. And he talks about it in his book, Feeling Good, specifically around procrastination, but I think it perfectly applies to loneliness as well. Tick is task interfering cognition and talk is task orienting cognition. And so if you can, you know, if you're having thoughts around loneliness, like, everyone is hanging out without me. Like, look at this picture on Instagram. It seems like these people don't even consider me a friend. A task orienting cognition is I should reach out to them and try to make a plan. If there's some way that you're not just replacing a negative thought with a positive thought, but you're actually replacing a hopeless thought with an action plan or task interfering cognition is we have nothing in common. Task orienting cognition is I barely know them enough. I, I, I hardly know. Or task interfering is all my friends are in relationships. Task orienting is like, they still probably want to hang out with me. There's so many ways to think that will reduce our feeling of loneliness. And that's within our reach right now. And that also aligns with improving your situation. One piece of research that you cite in your book that I hadn't heard of before, but I thought was, it just struck me hard that I'm going to quote from your book that when we crave companionship the most, we may be most at risk of misreading social cues in ways that leave us feeling disconnected or, for instance, misjudging another person's forgetfulness as maliciousness. And I think this TikTok exercise is so helpful given that we are more likely to drop into those maladaptive cognitions, those unhelpful distressing kinds of thoughts when we're feeling lonely. And then it sort of adds insult to injury because if we're misunder misreading the cues and then Ret socially retracting or, 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 you know, allowing those thoughts to kind of get us off track with engaging in ways that we do want to be building our lives. It, it really just gets us that much more stuck. And so recognizing that when we feel lonely, we're even more likely to have those interfering kinds of thoughts and that the way that we can combat it is by making an action plan, getting more active and out of our minds and into our lives. Exactly. And yeah, that applies in so many situations. When our emotions are really high, it's really hard to think clearly. And so we really need to kind of hold our hold our thoughts lightly and, and think about what we would do if we didn't really believe those. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on dating apps and, and whether they're the best way to meet people. 
And also sort of a secondary question to that is, what do you recommend for folks who don't want to use dating apps to meet dating partners in, in the modern world that we live in? It's, it's such a tough question because I hear so often, almost all of my patients that are on dating apps have so many complaints that are so valid and I, I get it. I really do. I've been on a lot of dates. I understand that meeting someone that you don't have shared contacts with, that seeing a lot of people can be the perfect setup for bad behavior and feeling disregarded. And, you know, people are constantly telling me it's pretty normal to have someone cancel plans last minute after weeks of back and forth chatting. And um, it's incredibly frustrating, but I'm also all about doing what works, trying to be effective, finding some sort of middle path. And today in 2022, most people that are single, especially, you know, at points in their lives when they're not necessarily meeting tons of new people, if they're, you know, in a relatively, you know, quiet part of town or their workplace doesn't really allow for like meeting tons and uh, tons, tons of people, it's really hard. And it's also really, it, it can be tricky also to navigate like workplace romance these days. It's hard, you know, even somewhere like a conference, it's, it would be really inappropriate for someone to pursue other kinds of relationships with, with you other than purely professional. And so I, I fully 100% validate that dating apps are really complicated and it's really unfortunate. And I know there's a lot of work to be done on the app development side to improve things, but I also do hear so many hopeful stories of people that have made dating apps work for them or found ways to meet people that they never would have otherwise met. And I think to go into that with some sort of lens towards problem solving, can you quickly, you know, make a plan to get on a quick, you know, two minute FaceTime call rather than weeks of back and forth, useless banter of, Hey, what's up? How was your weekend? And can you pick a place that's not going to lead you to feel so resentful before you even meet the person? And can you have like a plan for 45 minutes to an hour rather than an open ended entire evening that's going to make you, you know, feel like you lost a half a day. Um, so, you know, again, I, I agree that it's not ideal, but it's, it works for many people if you can do it in a way that honors your needs. Yeah. It reminds me of a book that Aziz Ansari co-wrote with Eric Kleinenberg, I believe the name is, about modern dating. And he talks about that apps, they talk about apps being a way to meet people, but not really a way to form relationships, that they really just help you get off the couch to meet people that you otherwise might not. Exactly. And if you can brainstorm some activities that you would enjoy, where you might also meet people, if there's a local trivia night, tennis club, language class, something that would allow you to meet people, go for it. But also, it's very helpful to have other means of doing so, especially if those correlate with, you know, what tends to lead to connecting these days. Yeah. And so, you know, there's sort of like the initial meet um, and media tells us that from the actual meeting of people that we fall for each other based on looks or clever banter. But what do we actually know about what helps us form deeper, more long lasting relationships in the dating world? Shared values and kind communication habits um, really like looks are the first to go. We really struggle actually, because we're all prone to fall to something called the halo effect. If someone's attractive, we might assume all sorts of positive qualities about the person. But as we all know from our own experience, probably that attraction has nothing to do with longevity of a relationship or a sense of that this person is actually kind just because you have a really great time doesn't mean that that's going to bode well for your fourth encounter. And so as much as I want people to feel some level of attraction, that's not the first top priority I encourage people to look for. I really encourage people to look for people that want similar things in life, that care about the same ultimate goals and that have the same kind of moral compass and also that that really are kind people like people that are kind um that's that's kind of at the end of the day what everyone needs yeah I love that. I, I think that there's so much value in saying, you know, everybody gets to pick their own values of what they want to their lives to stand for, but that when it comes to relationships, kindness is is pretty pretty much a priority 
right? Because you don't want to be with somebody who's going to treat you without kindness. That probably isn't going to work for the long term. Exactly. And communication is everything. And that's one of the biggest predictors of divorce, people engaging in critical patterns, whether that's you know, stonewalling or doing something like contempt, which is really terrible. These are both things that John Gottman talks about as very strong predictors of divorce. So it's great to have some level of attraction. You know, you want, I want people to have attraction and connection and some sort of good connection. But on top of that, you know, some people tell me that they naturally go for people that are less kind. And that's really something that I encourage them to work on because that's a huge part of self-compassion. Yeah. What What's your advice for starting a conversation on a date? I mean, it, it, I guess it kind of goes with this question of like, how quickly should you dive into figuring out whether or not you have shared values? Should you stay more superficial in the beginning or should you get deep quick? And I know that there's not a one size fits all, but what's your typical advice for starting conversations in the early part of a dating relationship? You know, I, I think you might unfortunately lose people if you jump to to intense questions right off the bat. I love an acronym from a therapy called Dialectical Behavior Therapy. And the acronym is GIVE, GENTLE, it stands for gentle, interested, validating, and easy manner. And so it can be kind of hard for someone to, you know, just the same way in exercise, you need kind of a warm up before you do some of the heavy lifting. And you know, personally, it's going to be hard for someone to want to put in the effort of telling you what they, what they're actually looking for until there's some level of connection, communication, rapport. And so while it's so understandable that you'd love to fast forward, it's important to kind of be willing to go through some of the preliminary pleasantries before taking it to that level. But I certainly don't want people to feel like they need to wait like till months into knowing someone before asking them what they're looking for or what their long-term hopes are. And I think there are ways using the GIVE acronym to infuse this in a way that doesn't sound really intense or grilling or like you're putting someone, you know, through an interrogation. Yeah. I love that because I think it's a balance, right? You want to show up in an authentic way, but you also don't want to come in too heavy handed um, because it can be intimidating or overwhelming in the process of getting to know someone new. And so having that gentle, easygoing, validating kind of manner or, or having that acronym in mind as you try to show up as authentically as you can without uh, can can offer a reminder to kind of stay a little bit lighter at the front end of things as you're getting to know somebody. So I love that. And, and that kind of leads me to my next question, which is, you know, I think authenticity is absolutely important in dating because if somebody is going to pair up with you, you want them to know who you actually are. So there's sort of the the balance of like staying authentic, but not being too heavy handed. But then there's also the the challenge of staying authentic when we get really caught up in these worries about being liked or, or the fear of being rejected. And so can you provide some guidance on how we can work to stay authentic in, in a, in a appropriate, healthy, effective way uh, without getting too caught up in those worries and fears? It's so tough because this might have so much to do with sort of your unique circumstances, but at the end of the day, I think we all need to be ourselves and be true to ourselves and but also be mindful that we people generally do well with people that are flexible and so there's this fine balance between being who you are but also honoring someone else's wants and needs to some degree and so th this is kind of tricky without getting into specifics but for instance I'm a vegetarian and maybe I would do something like suggest a restaurant that has a range of options, but not necessarily go for like the, a raw vegan restaurant that would potentially be my first choice. And so I think there's some line between both, you know, advocating for your personal wants and needs, but also being gracious and thinking about, you know, win-win for both. I wanted to end with a note about something that you write in your concluding chapter. And you kind of referenced this earlier, and I, I, I just want to come back to it because I think it's absolutely true. But when you sent the manuscript to a colleague that you admired, you panicked when you got a note back stating that he stated that you hadn't really written a book about being single. But then you were reassured as you read on because what he wrote was that you had written a book about advances 
in living fulfilling lives, regardless of our circumstances, a book about how to live optimally, whether we are alone or in the company of others. And I'm just curious if you had sort of set out to do that, or if writing about how to be happy and single um, just led you to wisdom that kind of applies to living well, regardless of circumstance. I, you know, I, I wanted to kind of take positive psychology and apply it to being single, but I, there's so much overlap. I mean, whether you're struggling with chronic pain or being unhappy with your relationship status, like they're core things that regardless of our circumstances will improve our quality of life. And everything I wrote about in the book is the stuff that I'm doing now. And I'm trying to do right now, I should say, because it's, you know, we all go through moments when we're better about being present and values based on than other times. But, you know, I, I think a lot of people feel like their current situation is um, defining of them, but we're all so alike and the things that work well, like all around apply independent of your unique circumstances. Yeah, maybe. And that brings me to maybe a final point, which is one of the exercises that I love that you offer is to have people create a pie of the different elements that make them up. So, you know, your relationship status is one piece of the pie. And when you're single and wanting not to be single, it can feel like it's the majority of the pie. But if you sit down and really work it through and think about the various things that that you represent, you know, your your role in your family, your role in your work, your hobbies, um, your values, your your exercise habits, your uh, creativity, that you can see that your relationship status is just a small part of it. And that can really help you to bring some perspective in and, and that can lead you to being more open to some of those happiness practices that kind of get you out of focusing overly intensely on this one element that you may be feeling stuck on for the moment. Yes, we all need to have like a full rich life and people that are, you know, with partners and children also need to attend to the other facets of their life. And people that are single need to be mindful that there is so much more right with them and their relationship status and they perceive as wrong. Well, thank you so much for all of your wisdom. It's a great book, so full of research and just really on the ground practices that you can do like in the here and now to be a happier, more satisfied person, whatever your circumstances. So I really recommend the book. Jenny, where can people go to find out more about you and your work? My website is drjennytates.com, J-E-N-N-Y-T-A-I-T-Z and doctor is just D-R. And I try so hard to be mindful in my own life. So I'm not super active on social media, but I am on uh, Twitter and Instagram, but not as uh, frequently posting because I am all about being present in your life rather than uh, posting on the internet. Thank you so much. Thank you. This was such a treat. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. If you enjoy our podcast, you can help us out by leaving a review or contributing on Patreon. You can get more psychology tips by subscribing to our newsletter, and you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Connect with us on social media and purchase swag from our merch store by going to our website at offtheclockpsych.com slash merch. We'd like to thank our strategic consultant, Michael Harold, our dissemination coordinator, Katie Rothfelder, and our editorial coordinator, Melissa Miller. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and is not meant to be a substitute for mental health treatment. If you're having a mental health emergency, dial 911. If you're looking for mental health treatment, please visit the resources page of our website, offtheclockpsych.com.